Good evening. Welcome to the Computer History Museum. I am Steve Smith. I'm a uh, trustee here at the museum and your museum host tonight. I'm filling in for John Holler, our terrific CEO. Uh, John's on the road expanding our uh, collection and our endowment and a few other things uh, this week, so uh, they asked me to step in. Tonight's program is titled, as you see, Venture Capital in Silicon Valley, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. I know we're in for a most intriguing and timely discussion. Uh, we'll get to the program here in a couple of minutes. <clears throat> this event is part of our 2011 lecture series celebrating revolutionaries. These lectures feature conversations with and about some of the most distinguished thinkers in the history and in the current uh, uh, goings on of the computer and information age. The Revolutionaries Lecture Series complements the launch of our permanent exhibit downstairs. Hopefully many of you have seen it. It's called um, Revolution, the first 2,000 years of computing. I should mention that if you like this program, you probably will also be interested in or may have already seen a film called Something Ventured. Something Ventured uh, was made in 2010, finished in 2011. It's a film about the early history of venture capital. Dick Kramlick, of course, features prominently in the film as one of the pioneers. If you haven't seen it, I strongly commend it to you. It's going to be shown at the Palo Alto uh, International Film Festival uh, with showing dates on September 30 and October 2nd at the Palo Alto Square Theater. And here at the museum, we will be screening that film on a regular basis. So um, uh, please find an opportunity and watch that film. It's terrific. Dick's a really big star. So let's get on with the show. Um, let me first uh, introduce Richard Waters, tonight's panel moderator. Richard is the West Coast editor for the Financial Times, also known as the FT or this pink paper that you see in sophisticated readers' hands everywhere on the globe. Um, Richard joins uh, a growing list of experts who serve as moderators for telling the stories of the computer age, and we are delighted to have him on the list. Our two panelists tonight represent uh, both the history and the future of venture capital. Dick Kramlick is well known and highly respected as the founder of New Enterprise Associates, NEA for short, and is truly a pioneer and thoughtful leader in the industry. And joining Dick is Teresa Galranzetta. She's a general partner at Axel Partners. She's proven herself to be a leader among the new generation of venture capitalists. And those who know Teresa would say that the next generation of venture capital is going to be just as great as all the history put together. Teresa is terrific. And uh, I know you'll find that out for yourselves as they come up and chat with you. So come on up. So, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a delight to be here to have such a big audience uh, in this wonderful uh, uh, institution. And, um, you know, it's, uh, since we're in the History Museum, um, we'll start by just mentioning that it's, it's 50 years ago this year that Arthur Rock, um, who you know, in many ways was the founder of this industry, venture capital, uh, packed up his bags in New York, raised $5 million for his first fund, and came out west. And, uh, you know, $5 million back then for startup money was a really risky, radical thing. And then you stop and you think, you know, we're living in a world now of billion-dollar venture capital funds and billion-dollar venture capital losses, or nearly billion dollars if you, if you look at Solyndra, the solar company, uh, and, you know, this, is, this industry has changed dramatically. We all like to think of it and talk about it as though it's the same cottage industry that it always was. Um, and yet, you know, the world has changed. And so um, I'm particularly looking forward to, you know, hearing from Dick's long experience and Teresa's on where it's going next. So let's, let's start with, um, you know, where we've come from. Uh, Dick, you know, how did you actually get to be where you are? Uh, by listening to my uh, inner thoughts. Uh, now, seriously, uh, 
you know, I've always, uh, I've always been uh, an advocate of the entrepreneurial process from the time I was, you know, old enough to pull a wagon. And um, my... I, so you were a born entrepreneur. I was so. a born entrepreneur. And my grandfather and father both started their own companies. And, um, and I, you know, it's just I sort of the American creed. I just believed in it. I think uh, I, I'm an advocate of human development, human growth. I like to see people win. And um, so I, um, I, it comes really straight from my personal philosophy. Uh, functionally, how, it, how I got into it was, um, so I was, uh, when I, I, I was in the Air Force and then I went to Harvard Business School and they had a very impressive guy there by the name of George Dorio who was, who was a professor. He was a French general in World War, World War II, logistics general. And he had this class that called manufacturing, but it wasn't about manufacturing, it was about venture capital. I'll cut this short, but you'll see part of it in the film, But the because uh, they asked, Tom Perkins was in that class. And I got there, um, I was from the Midwest, not from the East Coast, and so I thought this would be a great class to sign up for. I found out there were 200 people ahead of me, and so I couldn't get into the class. Fast forward, um, I wound up staying in, in Boston for a while, and I came back, or left and came back, and I wound up living on a street called Lime Street, Turns out General Dorio lived right across the street from me. And so he'd get out of the, he'd come out of his house and I'd come out of my house and he'd walk, we'd walk together for a while. So the first time he saw me, he said, oh, I remember you, you were one of my best students. I said, you know, General Dorio, I hate to say this, but I couldn't get into your class. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, next time we had a block cocktail party, he said to somebody the same thing and I decided, from there on in, I wasn't going to correct him. Trade on the <laughs> <laughs> But he was a great guy, and he, and Tom will tell you this, that in the, in the film, he says, he bought the whole idea hook, line, and sinker, and I would agree with that. But how, how, so, how was it that a French general, a French former general, was at Harvard teaching venture capital when there was no venture capital? It was... Well, he formed a company called American Research and Development Corp. in 1947. And, uh, I mean, <laughs> he made one really good investment. And um, that was um, DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation. And uh, it accounted, it was publicly held. It was the first uh, venture capital firm of any real size. The, the real founders of the business were, uh, De, uh, were Lawrence Rockefeller and uh, Jock Whitney. And they were, they really deserve the credit for setting the bar the way it is and the kind of people and the mission and the belief in the journey and that sort of thing. And it was really, uh, and they, and, you know, they put a certain uh, elan on the whole practice that was just, that got it off on the right foot. So General Dorio was in the same mode. He was a philosopher, really is what he was. And he knew logistics, and logistics were sort of a form of technology in a way. It was, yeah, you had to, get from here to there and get the most efficient way of getting your supplies in this place to that place. So it was an early form of, of you know, information and data comp compilation and that sort of thing. So it was, uh, it was sort of a natural. But what he really found, he, he was just a terrific philosopher. And he used to tell these people that the thing they should do when they get up in the morning is to read the New York Times, starting with the obituaries. <laughs> Because that was where you could find stories of people. I've all, I've all, I always read the obituaries in the New York Times because they're novelettes. They're really great stories of people and the ups and downs of their life and what they have accomplished. It's fantastic. So you, so you then packed up your bags and came out west and joined? No, no. What that. happened is I did a couple of stops along the way and I worked for a fellow who was Howard Hughes' first right-hand man. And he was a taskmaster and a terrific guy. By this time, he was the executive VP of the Kroger Company in Cincinnati. And he wanted to really redo the entire company, computerize it, really get it going. He needed a right-hand guy. He had known my father, and so he, he called me and uh, tracked me down. I was out, Steve and I were talking about this before the session tonight. I'll make this short, but the long and short of it is I had a great corporate experience for five years, and I said, 
what I really want. That was, I was age 29, and I said, I really want to get into something that has to do with companies and growth. That's really what I wanted to do. And I'd had a little taste of corporate experience. It was very instructional. And I joined a group of uh, fellows who were 40 years older than I was in Boston. And so that's when I went back there and across the street from General Dorio. And, um, but the long short of it is, is I got them, you know, we were going around Route 128 looking for new companies. And um, we had about 10% of the capital under management that we would devote to venture capital activities one at a time, you know, and that's the way they used to do it. And uh, so in 19, I didn't, I was kind of about to tell you this, but uh, so I uh, had an apartment on, on Beacon Street. My wife was uh, gone back to Texas to see her mother, and uh, Forbes had this series of articles on, on uh, they called it Money Men. So Arthur Rock was uh, the first one in that series of articles, and they talked about the partnership that you were referring to. Tommy Davis called it Davis and Rock. Tommy Davis was a great guy and deserves a lot of credit, and as well as Arthur. And so uh, long and short of it is that they had run five, with just under five million to about 80 million, 82 million in a run from 61 to 68. And it was great. And they had a number of good companies. I won't go into it all, but they were really doing well. Intel was formed in 1968 after that. Anyway, um, so I sat down when I read this article and I said, well, Mr. Rock, what are you going to do from here? And he said, well, I'm going to find a younger partner and do it all over again. I never in my life ever written a letter to anybody like just like that, out of the blue, but I, did, and I never have since. So it was a risk. You took a big risk. I took a big risk. And I was your own startup. And, I, wow. and, and I, so I, uh, I wrote him a letter and I said, you know, how you spend your life is pretty important and here's what I've been doing up to this point. And, uh, we had gone through a phase in the firm I was with where we had merged with another firm and had gone from really being these really fabulous older guys to being more of a uh, organization that was sort of corporate in its way. And I'm not, I just, I don't Stop. bake in that kind of atmosphere. So I thought it was, I thought it was time to push off and really do 100% VC because I found out when we were managing money, basically, if I was out in the field, I should be back at the office. When I was at, out in the office, I should be out in the field, and I just couldn't put the two together. I couldn't reconcile the right way to do things. So I wrote Arthur this so note, you, well. and uh, and he and I, my wife came home. And I said, "I've done the most foolish thing. I wrote this guy a note." And she said, "You'll hear from him." The following Monday, I got a call from Arthur. I found out that he had over a thousand letters sent to him with resumes and everything. Mine was the only handwritten note. I didn't know much about it. So evidently, he, he sent it out to uh, a handwriting expert. And I... <laughs> so uh, people asked me about that note, and I said, I, I didn't think anything about it. It must have been up and to the right. So, <laughs> and so anyway, we spent a year talking to each other. What do you think about that? What about this technology? Do you know this person? Let's do a deal together, blah, blah, blah. So we so, worked on it for a year, and, and then he asked me to come out and join him. So at the time, you were inventing a new way of financing things. That's it right. Was make it up as you go along, get out on the road, find some businesses. And right. And I told my wow. new, I was the EVP at this point of this organization, and the president was a really good guy, but it wasn't going to be my thing. I said, you know, Jack, we're going to be in this business. And Greylock had just started. They were about uh, two floors up in the same building. I said, if we're going to do this right, let's organize a pool of capital so I don't do this one at a time thing because it's, it's dysfunctional. Unscalable. Unscalable. Yeah. So he said, well, we have lots of priorities and that's not one of them. So I said, okay. So that's how I got into it. So, Teresa, let's fast forward a little bit to when, when you got into this business. How different did it look? I mean, uh, you know, back then people were making it up. Shall we have a fun? Shall we? How do we get out there and find businesses? By the time you came along, what did you see? What attracted you? Um, so I joined Axel in January of 1999, uh, which is an interesting time for those of you who remember it, to be in the venture business or in entrepreneurship, specifically anything having to do with the internet. Um, so it had changed a lot, obviously. So by then, you know, um, everyone had funds. 
Um, unfortunately, a lot of people also had, you know, funds had doubled and tripled in size from even from sort of early 90s to late 90s. And the number of venture capital firms between the late 80s and the late 90s, I believe, increased by tenfold. So it certainly wasn't a cottage industry. It had become highly professionalized. And, um, you know, I would say with the benefit of history, you know, overcapitalized, probably still is, still a ways to go. Um, just briefly, though, I mean, it was so venture capital, so unlike Dick, who, you know, he knew about it, he knew what he wanted to do, and he set out under very difficult circumstances, one out of a thousand or more, um, and got into the business. For me, becoming a venture capitalist was basically, you know, by accident. Um, briefly, the story for me is, and I think this is a lot of other people who, who are in this room um, as entrepreneurs and then also as venture capitalists, was really sort of a story of sort of migration or immigration and really being drawn to Silicon Valley. Being somebody who loved technology, um, went to school to be an engineer. Um, my first job was as a design engineer in a General Motors factory in Western New York near my hometown. A thousand design engineers, two females. Um, but that was, that was like easy street compared to being on the manufacturing floor. Anyway, but what I thought was really interesting were the people who were actually running products, right? So not just sitting behind the CAD cam and running test stands, but actually doing design. All of those guys had gotten MBAs, so I decided to get an MBA. And when I was fortunate enough to apply, I had the opportunity to come out here to Stanford. Well, for me, somebody who loves technology, it was a no-brainer. But even at this point, I still didn't know what venture capital was. I was just, you know, I was going to come out here, be in the middle of it all, and I was going to become a product manager at HP. That was what I'm pretty sure I wrote my business school essay about. Um, but once you're here, you can't help but be just enamored with the spirit of entrepreneurialism. And you know, you have people who are great venture capitalists like Dick, or you have entrepreneurs um, like Freddie Gibbons and others who come, come in and talk to you, or Mitch Kapoor, about starting some of the early PC software companies. And so as soon as I paid off my um, student loans, I quit my consulting job and joined two guys that I went to business school with who had just raised a million dollars of venture capital. And this was in 1996, um, and that was a lot of money, still back Go then. Um, the name of the company was called Release Software. We were a bit early. We were doing digital rights management and electronic software distribution for software downloads. Um, some of our first customers um, were Symantec and Macromedia, Netscape, um, and Intuit. So either very small software packages or things that professionals would use um, at work and had shared T1 access. Um, anyway, so I did, at this point, I still barely knew what venture capital was. Um, but then I was lucky enough to join a couple guys that I worked with. Um, and uh, they were, uh, the founder was highly technical, and we had a VP of engineering. And the other gentleman that I went to business school with sort of ran the finance and the operations. So I ended up doing sales and business development marketing because I wasn't afraid to pick up the phone and cold call. I learned about venture through that because part of it was, you know, million dollars seems like a lot of money until six months later when <laughs> you have three months left to payroll in. So I worked a lot with the founders on raising capital and I was fortunate enough to be there for several years. And through that process, I just decided that I fell in love with the really early formation stage. And um, I was lucky enough, one of, the, one of the investors on my board, um, when I went to him and said, you know, look, I, I want to go do something and I want to be a founder and any other interesting companies to join. He said, I'm going to introduce you to three of my portfolio companies and I'm going to introduce you to three other venture capital firms because we're not raising capital right now, but this is late 98, early 99. A lot of people are raising really big funds. Sorry, this is kind of gets back to how much it changed. So a lot of people are raising really big venture funds. They're all looking for new talent to come and join them. Everybody's looking for, you know, young associates or junior partners to help them invest this. And especially they want to know about people who know about the internet, since we were an e-commerce company doing software downloads. So I was Rest fortunate enough to... Uh, Rest history. Yeah. But the that when you joined Excel? That was when I joined Excel, January 99. I was fortunate enough to be, you know, a lot of it is sort of being right place, right time. Had, right. had interesting background, 
for the time. So the the, the by accident, the, as you describe it, seems to be um, something you find in the career, career path of a lot of VCs. I mean, right. no one, few people start out thinking, I really want to be a VC. So I, I don't know a polite way of asking this question, so I'll just ask it directly. But is, is VC the refuge for failed entrepreneurs? You've both yes. been involved in startups. You've both admitted to having that entrepreneurial bug. I... Dick. Well, I, I don't think so. <laughs> Shouldn't you be out there doing it? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, there are a few that I guess, I, I would say it's the other way around, that a lot of successful uh, entrepreneurs go into VC. Yeah, but it's, uh, if I understand your question properly, uh, I mean, I, I don't think a failed entrepreneur should be a VC necessarily, unless he's capped a failure with a success. Uh, you know, so I mean, we we know that one of the the bylines. Deep, deep down, do you wish you were running your own? Well, you are running your own business, but did you did you always want to be a an entrepreneur? I you put your finger on it. I feel that my entrepreneurial instincts are really put to work in help, helping to build uh, new enterprise associates. I felt that's an entrepreneurial activity. When we started the firm. The two partners and I, one of them particularly, said, let's build a partnership that's going to last for 100 years. So we actually set up all the precepts of what we did in the very beginning. We said shared values, shared, shared goals, shared values, and shared rewards. So we did it in an entirely different way than most of the firms in our business do it. So what, so what, makes, a, what makes a good VC? Um, it, you talked about your backgrounds, you, you know, so business school, some business experience, finding your way into financing. When you, when you look at the profile of the VC industry, I think an MVCA survey from a couple of years ago showed that a you know, very high proportion of VCs have MBAs. Relatively small number have engineering degrees. So a lot of, something like 19% with engineering background and 68% with MBAs. Uh, so, and then one in eight from Harvard. One in eight from Harvard. So um, there is a certain background that's... It's all because of General Dorio. It's all because of General Dorio. <laughs> um, but, um, and, and obviously very large, largely male. So I think something like 86% of the people in that survey who made investment decisions were male. When was this so survey taken? This was two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. So it seems to be you know, a, a type rather than um, entrepreneurs. We're getting a lot of... MBAs in the industry, is that? I would say I, the fault I find with those statistics is largely on the engineering side. We have two-thirds of our people are engineers. And uh, a half of them, the, on the med side, we have uh, MD, MBAs, um, some of them, combinations, or they're just strictly MDs or PhDs in, in biotech, biopharma. But on the tech side, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, almost half of them have run their own companies successfully. Yeah. Similar experience? I, I was very surprised on the engineering and computer science because I, as I'm just clicking through my own, you know, not only our firm at Excel, but the other people that I've, you know, been on boards with. And it feels to me like it's actually a, a, a majority of people. Um, I don't know if it's 50, 60, it's not 100, but a majority of people have engineering or technical degrees at some point. I think the other thing about your statistic, which I'm sure is accurate, is, and it gets back to your first question, Richard, which is there's been a lot of evolution in, you know, in the venture capital business, both as a business from being sort of having to raise funds deal by deal to having, you know, $100 million, billion dollar funds, but also the type of person coming into the business. So I think that, you know, look, the reality is if you are interested, if you were interested in, in business and technology at all in the, I would say, for me, even in the 80s, you know, there was a path. You got a bachelor's degree in engineering or computer science, and then yes, you went and you got your MBA. And I'm not surprised it's Harvard because, you know, um, even today, Harvard graduates a much larger MBA class than, say, Stanford does, for example. Um, and Harvard, for the longest time, was the place. So I think part of those statistics are drawn, I think, if you looked at different cohorts, right? I think it'd be interesting if you looked at people in making investment decisions who joined the business in the 70s, 
the 80s, the 90s, and then the, thou the current millennium, the thousands, whatever, um, I think you would find slightly different um, backgrounds for people. I agree. So, so, so what does make a successful venture capitalist? And you're not allowed to say you just got to be smart because there are a lot of smart people out luck. there. And you're not allowed to say just luck because that's the other thing you hear a lot here. But when you say, or, well, let me reinterpret that. When you say luck, you presumably mean put yourself in the right position to see the right, the best deals. Is that really what it's about? That's part of it. You have to have a you know, variety of things that you're talking about. You have to actually, I think, intuitively get ahead of the curve. You know, people say yeah, we get paid for looking around corners. And uh, I don't think it's possible to look around a corner unless you're at the corner. So I think it really means you have to push yourself all the time to stay on the corner. No matter what it is, no matter how old you are, it doesn't matter whether you're an engineer or history major or anything else, or an economist. I mean, you have to push yourself at, to be at the corner so you have a feeling of what is going to happen next. And that's kind of where, that, that's a continual challenge. It's, it's a lot of fun, actually. You learn a lot. I mean, I'm into lifelong learning. And so, for me, it's not work. But there are a lot of firms and a lot of people here standing on that corner in Silicon Valley looking around at, at the next thing. Why is it that we see certain firms, and both of yours count here, I think, that get consistent returns and others that don't? What, what accounts for that, Teresa? So I think that it's two things. So I think for the people, it's very much what Dick said. You want to look for somebody who loves technology and loves learning. We talk about it all the time, learning curve. You know, I think that we're sort of, we're sort of paid dilettantes. We're paid to learn about the next new thing. And if you, if you search for that on the incoming talent into your firm, I think that gets you a long way. But in terms of why do some firms like the NEAs or the Axels kind of persist in multiple types of return environments. Here I would definitely say I think, you know, and there's a lot, I think this gets lost now, um, but I, I'm a huge believer of it. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a result of it, right? This is an apprenticeship business, and part of it is because the firms that continue to do well year in and year out in good, good markets and bad market cycles, because we certainly, if we learn nothing from 99, 2000, we are just... Silicon Valley, no matter how amazing the technology is that we create, when the capital markets decide, or even 2008, when the capital markets make moves, we're just, we're the tail. Um, so it is the firms, like what Dick talked about, who think about it going in. Think about the idea of bringing in new talent on an ongoing basis and actually training people and helping them understand, you know, each firm is different, has its own personality, but each firm has to really invest in bringing in the next generation of investors. And that sounds very obvious for people who work in companies, succession planning, you know, mentoring, training, that's sort of normal. But you have to remember, venture capital firms aren't real companies, we're partnerships. And if you think about other kinds of partnerships, law, I mean, that's less of the mentality. But key, but key to this is putting yourself in a position to see the best deals, whether it's because you have the foresight mm -hmm. to work out where things are going next or whatever. So to what extent um, have the, uh, is this a, is this a, a case of self-reinforcing brands? That if you're a success as a venture capital firm, then any self-respecting entrepreneur is going to want to have a successful financier behind them. Uh, whether it's an NEA or an Axel or a Sequoia or a Kleiner. Um, so that presumably puts you in a position to, to get a look early at the best deals. Is that really what, what this industry is all about? That, uh... It's changed a lot. I'd just like to inject one other thing. And first of all, uh, I'll make two brief comments. Number one is that uh, our, the talent in our firm starts at the bottom, let me tell you. There is no question in my mind, the smartest people in the room are the people who are the youngest people in our firm. And the refreshing of those, we have interns, et cetera, et cetera, and the youngest partners. I mean, they're just, they're just very bright people with of, oftentimes a lot of experience. The second thing and the most important thing are the character of the people, the personality of the people, and the skills of the people that we're partnering with. We look at entrepreneurs as partners. And that's the way we try to handle ourselves. We, we look at this on a long-term basis, and these take years. So 
I'd say it really comes down to judgment of people. I think one of the most important things a partner can be for another partner is to save him or her from, her, from herself or himself because all of us have shortcomings. But if you can say, you know, Richard, you're mostly right about this person, except is that, you know, this is a lonely business and this is a business going to take, you know, you know, and in athletics you think of sustained effort as the differentiator between a good athlete and a great athlete. And when you dig below the surface, you'll find great athletes are, have sustained effort. And so that's what you're really doing, is you're using common sense to evaluate somebody else's dedication to this mission that is one of the hardest things they'll ever do in their life. What little, what little tricks have you developed over the years to make sure that you get your foot in the door before Teresa and Axel turn up or anybody else? Come on, tell us the truth, Dick. I don't think there's any the one way. Is it about the network? Your personal yes, network? Yes, you know, 60% uh, of the people in our firm, in our companies are people we've worked with before. And they know our DNA, we know their DNA, and they know we're straight shooters, and we expect them to be straight shooters, and, and we have a mission. There are oftentimes the odds are against you, but sometimes you, if you uh, persevere and uh, are lucky, I agree with luck, you know, it'll work out right. What do you do, Teresa? Apart from trust your luck, what, what do you do to make sure you get the best deals? Well, I think luck is about all the things that you talked about, right? So, which is, you know, it certainly helps to get to your question about brands and being self-reinforcing. It certainly helps to increase your chances of being lucky if you can see more. And it's true that your chances of sort of coverage, deal coverage, which is if you've got some interesting companies in the portfolio, other, other entrepreneurs will be drawn to speaking to the financiers of like, oh, I like, you know, Groupon or Facebook or whoever. I have a company sort of like that. I want to go try to find the people who back those entrepreneurs. But the difference, and this is why I, I keep talking about, it's about continually bringing on more and more people. There are many, you know, there are many more fine venture firms that are not like NEA, who have not survived. I mean, some of the biggest backers of some of the companies in the early 80s, TBI and MPAE, great firms, right? But they don't sustain. And so you have to constantly be bringing in new talent. I guess I feel it even more now. I mean, I spend, I split my time between security software and consumer internet. And in consumer internet, I think, I counted it up last year because someone asked me the stat. I think the last six investments I've made there was only one founder who was over the age of 30. Um, so you're feeling old already. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, these are people who, I mean, they don't, they barely remember before there was an internet. I mean, you know, I'll it's a that. very different world. And so yeah. my point is, it helps success beget success, but only if you continue to work hard at it. Only right. if you continue to be maniacal in your drive and focus and your paranoia for winning and seeing the next big deal. And part of that is investing the time to bring in the next generation of investors because the chances are, you know, the 25-year-old associate who we just hired probably knows these 25-year-olds, you know, because they, they went to school together. They didn't go to school with me. I mean, when I graduated from Stanford, they were in preschool. So, you know, um, now we all have a role to play, but I mean, then part of it is you also want to choose people who have excellent people judgment, and part of the people judgment is knowing when you might have the networks and the connections, but other people, Dick, because he's seen a business that looks like this before, he's the right person to go ask about, is this a business model that makes sense? Um, when uh, I was describing just now the results of that NBCA survey about you know, the sort of networks that you connect to and move in here. One very glaring thing is the shortage of women in these networks. Um, Teresa, what's it like being uh, a female partner in a venture capital firm in the Valley? Because there aren't many of you. Well, again, I just go back to, it all depends on where you come from, right? So when you start out, your first professional job is two out of a, a thousand, li literally two out of a thousand. Um, women in a, in a building full of a thousand engineers where out of no malice people literally thought you were there to deliver the mail when people still had mail delivered to their desks. Um, you know, I guess it's all relative. So, so my view is I think Silicon Valley is like a wonderful, amazing meritocracy. 
because everything is about, this isn't about status. It's not even, it is about networks, but the networks are based on what have you done before? It's a network because, well, it was an NEA-backed entrepreneur before, so we know that he or she has delivered returns for us, so we're more likely to take the next business plan and the next pitch more seriously. I think it's based on results, ideas, and information. So why, so why, why so, so few women? So I think it's gotten, but it's gotten so much better since 1999, since I've been there, right? So I think that, you know, I, I, I because we have a network, so yeah, it's maybe about, 10 or 15% of the investment professionals and investment partners are women now, but that's up from single digits. By the way, that doesn't look, we're not doing any worse than corporate America. I mean, part of it is less, it's like 12% of Fortune 500 companies have um, female in the C-suite, and less than 10% of Fortune 500 have women on the board. So the reasons why are it takes time. So I think you need to find where entrepreneurs are bred by other entrepreneurs. So someone goes and works at a company that might still be private or might be public, but is a very innovative company. It's a company like what a Cisco is today. They buy a lot of small companies, they spin off technologies, and then that person says, hey, you know, this is really interesting. I love when we buy these little technologies or when I get to launch a new product. And it's, it's the second job or the third job that they think about, well, I don't need a job. I can go and start a company. And they've built the professional networks because they have other people who have gone off and started companies and raised venture capital. And so it takes time for that to happen. The number of women in the in venture-backed portfolios has increased, I can give you anecdotally and then quantitatively. So anecdotally, in the Excel portfolio, when I, you know, of my first six investments, I don't think I had any female executives, founders, or CEOs in any of those companies. Now in my current portfolio, I have probably 33 to 40% of my teams have either female founders, co-founders, or a female CEO. Part of that, I think there's two things driving that. Um, one is I see a massive increase in the number of entrepreneurs in their 20s, you know, this generation is just, they're, they're not doing the other thing. They're not waiting to do the job and then starting. They're just starting straight out of school. There's an MIT study that showed the average age of first entrepreneurial venture for MIT graduates, it's a longitudinal study going back to the 70s, used to be 40s, and now it's 27 for men and 28 for women. And it used to be a five-year delta. So what it says is, People are starting younger, and it's much more equal amongst male and female who are 25. Seeing that as well, Dick? Yes, uh, my, uh, you know, I've, I've, we've definitely seen that, and um, we have several women partners. My mother was an aeronautical engineer. She was the only woman in her class, and uh, so I grew up around a pretty strong woman, and I respect, uh, I've always respected uh, um, women. I think the other thing that the the whole, the whole business has changed enormously in the last 15 years. And not only just from women, I agree with your comment entirely about being a meritocracy. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it really has changed a lot. And um, people of all genders, all creeds, and everything, nationalities, everything has changed a lot. And, you know, we have two offices in India, two offices in China. And um, it's just a, the, the, it's a global business where it didn't used to be. Well, I want to get on to that global expansion right. soon because, I, because you've taken part in that directly. But um, uh, first of all, let's just go back to the, we were talking before about you know, investment returns and how, they're, how they are skewed in this industry. And a very relatively small number of firms traditionally have, have taken the lion's share of the profits. And for limited partner investors, uh, it's been a case of getting into the best funds. And if you're not in the right funds, then it hasn't been a great asset class. In very simple terms. What, what, why is that? And how does an industry uh, like this continue for so long, drawing in capital when so many people have not achieved decent returns? Well, it's a super cyclical business, super cyclical, because we are at the, the out, you know, the exits are really, in many ways, governed by the stock market. And uh, so that you're going to find these periods where you're just basically foreclosed. 
and the only way out is a, is a, is a merger. So, um, so starting with that, super cyclical. The second thing is that these partnerships are anywhere from seven to 12 years long. Ours are 12 years. And so that they uh, either succeed or they wither away on a very gradual basis. It takes a long time. It's, I call it slow motion death for the ones that are... Slow motion death. Death, yeah. right. It's just, it's really, in a lot of companies, and they depends on how you handle your fee structures, what they are, do you pay the fees back or don't you? And uh, so there are a lot of structural aspects to the business that are, you know, over, over you know, if you impose that on top of the super cyclicality, you have to get somewhere into a wave where you're at least syncopated, perhaps with luck, perhaps with foresight, so that you can at least, you know, have a chance of succeeding yourself. And uh, so I think that's a, that's, so those, those are aspects, why does, so the returns in the, and the returns in the, in the decade ending 2010 were really the poorest decade in, in history for the venture capital industry. And yet there were times during that decade where you could exit briefly for periods of time. I mean, in 02, I think it was, and 07 and 08, during very brief periods of time. But it's, uh, so the answer, the answer is, um, it went through a cycle. I like to think of this as uh, not a surprise because the industry really just started in 46. It went through, an, it went through, it was a 15 year development program uh, in the early 60s, and then it was gradual and went into quiescence in the 70s. It really started for real around 1980. We started in 1977. And, and then, you know, it, then it peaked in, a, in the year 2000 where we had over $100 billion of capital came in the business, way overfunded. A lot of people who didn't have the experience or the skill set to be in the business, coupled with the you know, the millennium scare, which never actually occurred, and coupled with the arrival of the internet and, you know, dreams of uh, beyond reality of the application of uh, you know, into the internet, what it could do for life. And so that had to run its course before it really settled down into a sense of reality. And so, you know, they went all through this evolution. So what I'm leading toward is that now if you really look at where we are now versus where we were 10 years ago, we were, when I was the uh, chairman of the NVCA in 94, 95, we had 200 firms in the business. It peaked out at over 1,200 firms in 2000, and now it's down to about 400 firms. 500 to 400 is going down. It made an investment of, uh, of over $5 million in any one year. But in, but, so, but, but in short, does it, mean, does it mean that the golden age of VC is behind us, that it was that period no. in the 80s and 90s? No, I'll tell you my, my, my apprehension. That's what I'm getting toward. So right now, if you really look at the top firms, because it's always been the top quarter of the firms, or really the top 10% of the firms, I actually are, are the ones that are successful in the business. And it's no guarantee of success. And it's not a sinecure. You have to work like crazy. I agree with her completely. And so what I'm getting to is that it's, a, it's actually as an industry matures, you go through some rapid expansion. You know, look at the car companies. They go down. Then a few companies survive. More capital is aggregated among those fewer firms. And either they continue to stay on their game or they atrophy. One of the two. It's a huge risk going forward. So what I'm... And now we have a lot of disincentives facing our business. I mean, you know, we're at a disadvantage in a lot of different ways. I can enumerate them if you're interested. <laughs> but the point is that the future of our business is not by any means assured. And I think if, you know, we get uh, lumped in with the private equity firms and the uh, hedge funds into, you know, not having carried interest be capital gains, it's a disaster for our business. And you were going to get on to carried interest so and tax I'm, at some So what point. I'm saying is this, is, one, is yeah. that the, we have, we're facing a considerable risk going forward. We have 15 or 20 firms that actually can, can field a team that knows, has all the attributes that we've just been talking about. So it's, it's a high risk going forward. If we look at those returns over the last 10 years, I mean, the, the VC industry has taken in 
more cash than it's paid out because there haven't been these sort of big exit periods you've talked about. Um, I'm assuming that both of your firms are sitting on 2000 era funds that are still in the red. So this is your chance to explain what went wrong? No, we don't have any 2000 era funds that are in the red. We have 199 year fund that's 199. in the red. 199, all right, let's call them the 199 fund. 99, 2000 fund. doing okay, same 2000 thing. Was that, so do we just write that off as a historical accident and we say to the limited partners, okay guys, that wasn't a good year, but don't look at that, let's look at everything else. Well, we don't like to do that, but uh, you know, we're trying like crazy to pull a miracle off and come back in the black on that one. We're, we're not done yet. So um, you know, the answer is no, we're not gonna hide it. It's a bad year. 99 was a tough year. If you're in the black in a 99, you're in the top quartile. But the, anyway, that's the uh, the point is that is that we uh, it's a in under any any metric you want to devise, if, other than the last 10 year metric, venture is the most successful asset class there is. It's because it's backing entrepreneurs who create years, new but, things, innovation. Uh, we're going to take questions, by the way, um, later on, and in, in 10 or 15 minutes, we'll collect questions. You should have cards you can pose your questions on, and I'll try and squeeze as many in as I can. Um, Teresa, what do you think about um, this returns question? Um, are returns ever going to be as good as they were in the 80s and 90s when they were consistently in the 20 and 30 percent? Or higher, a lot higher, actually. I, I, so I'll go back to a couple of things that Dick said. Number one, the answer is, if the, if the stock market for new tech equity issues is, remains open or opens and closes, today was a bad day, um, and we have, we have that window, then I think, yes, the top performing firms will be able to generate returns like what the top performing firms did back in the late, in the late 90s. But we are completely creatures of, you know, what's the stock market return going to be for, for NASDAQ? What's the openness for tech IPO issues? And if that's there, um, then I think you can have those kinds of returns again. But I go back to what you say because it's, it's mixing in a little bit. I, I think, it, as, as both you and Dick said, it's always been true that the top, you never want to invest in the average venture capital fund. In, in bull markets and bear markets, the return of the median venture capital fund has always been terrible worse than the, than the stock market. But in any market, good and bad, um, you wanna be, because take 99, okay, well, if you're, if you're at like 90 cents or 95 cents on the dollar for 99, well, that's not good in absolute, but what other asset, like 99 was terrible in all asset classes, right? So it's all relative because you're, you're thinking about when you're, when, you're, when you're our clients, the LPs, asset managers, university endowments, you're trying to figure out both, you know, growth of capital, preservation of capital in down markets. You want to lose less in down markets and make more in up markets. Um, and so I think that it's, it's true if you actually, if you don't look at the overall Cambridge statistics, ask LPs, do you think it's still a good investment to invest in the top decile or top 10 venture capital funds in good markets and bads? Every single one of them will say yes. But to answer the other question that you asked about why do people keep investing when they look at the average returns, it's always it's a combination of greed and fear. In, in up markets, they know that it's always true about the top 10, but the top 10 doesn't stay exactly the same. Eight of them might stay the same from one cycle to the next, but there's always two new ones. So everyone's out there trying to find the two next ones, right? And then in, in the fear markets on the bad side, right? It's like, well, you know, you don't want to be, you don't want to be the one who didn't get into the fund that had, you know, Apple or Google or Cisco or maybe Facebook because Facebook. you're going to get measured against all the other asset managers. And if you don't have that in your portfolio, you're never going to catch up. So, could I say one thing? Yeah. The other thing that's really significant is the, uh, the way that companies are started. And, we are in a whole new era on that. I'm, I like to say that I'm really thrilled to have lasted as long as I have in this business because, you know, I'm, I'm being basically egalitarian in the way I look at things. We are finally in an in a era where the individual is in charge of their own universe because the technology, Apple was the first company that actually designed itself to be user dominated. In other words, the user really was able, and they've carried through the philosophy from day one to now. 
And what's really happened is now with the with Web 2.0, uh, what we have in the social networking is a perfect example of this, is that now you can start companies on far less money than you ever could before. And so instead of you know, having to build out these huge systems companies and go through all a lot of things that, where you didn't really know how the consumer really felt about what was going on, consumers will tell you today. And what you can do is by using uh, all the tools that we have at our disposal, you can start a company on a half a million or a million dollars. So why, why do we need billion dollar venture capital funds? It remains to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, because I think that we have to have the talent within the firms to actually respond to all levels of investment. There's a, also, there are gaps in the marketplace. Private debt, we don't use any uh, debt as leverage, but we have growth equity as a component of our overall picture. And in those cases, you know, it's going to take 30, 40, 50 million dollars in an incremental way in order to get to the really value creation point in a company's existence. Those are so other needs, as well as this very efficient way of starting new companies. So you're going to be placing bigger bets on Some fewer are. companies. Teresa. Got to and, be balanced. And I, think, I think that it's absolutely true that, uh, I mean, even since 99, 2000 to now, the amount of capital it takes to sort of launch a consumer-facing, mobile or web property and see if it starts to work is definitely on the scale of a million or less. But why do you need more capital? Because the reality is when something really works, then the entrepreneur wants to invest more in order to grow faster. So that means, you know, either more, sur so great, you can prove that you can get 10,000 mobile app downloads on $500,000, but now you need a lot more engineers for features, you need to build your second app, you need infrastructure. And the second point, which you touched on briefly, but I think the global nature of our business, of, of our company's businesses becoming global almost immediately is both a massive opportunity, which is another reason why I think there's tons of reason to believe that the companies we invest in now can be so much bigger, so much more quickly than they have been before. And I know there's, you know, so some there companies is capital need. that, that, that right. are out there that we can't talk about right now where those numbers are out there. But it's also at the same time, there's capital need for that, right? I mean, if you want to be launched in in China and India and Russia and the United States and UK and Brazil all at the same time, I mean, the 500K or 700K isn't going to do it anymore. Right. All you've done is proof of concept. Exactly. Getting well, to proof of concept is much right. more capital efficient, but alternatively, because the size of the markets is so much larger, I think the total amount of capital until you sort of hit your sort of growth equilibrium point is larger. I've got a lot of questions stacking up here, so I'm going to ask you to really <laughs> compress these answers now because I'm going to try and pack some in. Um, just to go back to this question of the window that you raise, Teresa, um, you know, the, the, the other view that you hear in the Valley is actually a good company can go public whenever. eBay went public yes. in the fall of 98 after the Russian default and didn't stop eBay. Um, is there, um, and we assume that Facebook could go public tomorrow if they wanted to, is there an issue now uh, with the quality of uh, the pipeline that we're seeing coming out of, or coming coming towards Wall Street, where everything seems now to have suddenly stopped? Um, are we not? Does this mean that we just don't have the great businesses now that are ready in any market? No, I, knowing what knowing what I know about the size and scale of some of the companies that are Groupon is still portfolio. private, both of ours. Yeah. So I. I don't think that's the case. So I think it is absolutely true that great companies, not good companies, great companies. Great companies. Great companies can go public in any market, right? You can talk about eBay, you can talk about Netscape. Um, you can talk about a lot of companies that can do that. But I think that um, good companies, so companies which are growing very quickly and are within a quarter or two of profitability, there are windows when the market's open for them and windows when it's closed. Because when the market is feeling, you know, greedy, it, it's over-indexing towards growth and willing to sort of pay forward on investments because they believe that the model is converging. And in other markets, when they're really focused on profitability, I think that's when it's harder for high-growth tech companies like the kind that we have primarily here in the Valley. It's harder for them to go public. There are other places for an asset manager to get you know, more sure returns in big cap stocks, maybe not even tech, um, and, and it will go that way. 
Um, I don't think the quality of the companies in the pipeline, if you look at it now, I mean, go back in time, right? What was, what was the cumulative uh, revenue for eBay in the 12 months before they went public? Say that. <laughs> $1.2 million? Anybody who's got the Fortune Bubble article can correct me. It was one point something, right? So the size of the companies now that people are saying are too small or not profitable enough, I mean, they dwarf the size of the companies that were getting public, many of whom went on to become great multi-billion dollar market cap companies over time in the 99, 2000 time frame. So I don't buy at all that there are not enough quality companies to go public. We're in a bubblet here, you know, really. And My next question. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, because, I mean, we're seeing these the companies that started and with their efficient uh, models and they're really building into real companies. And there's a little bit of a piling on thing going on right now. And your colleague, Jillian Tett, made the point the other day at this event that Financial Times hosted that... Uh, her coming to Silicon Valley reinforced the thought that we are the most optimistic people on the face of the earth. That's good and bad, Dick. That's good and bad. <laughs> yeah, it's good and bad. But the point is that, yes, we are. And yes, there is a little bit of a bubble that's kind of restricted to parts of the ecosystem that we work in. Basically, corporate America is in very good shape. That's not the problem. Do you, do you actually lose sleep over bubbles? It often seems in the Valley that you know, people are fairly schizophrenic about the idea of a bubble. On the one hand, yes, it's waste and it's loss. On the other hand, it leads to this acceleration of business formation and, uh, and competition amongst, you know, this sort of Darwinian cycle speeds up and what comes out of it are big companies. I mean, how, how should we feel about that? I, I think that this is a magic that we have in this place that's not like nowhere else in the world. And, uh, you know, it, it is, uh, it is uh, you know, the wellspring of innovation, and uh, it's not going to quit. So uh, the answer is, yes, we're going to go through these bubblets, but we're going to try to persevere over the long but, run. It's a great thing. But the paradox is that a lot of those companies formed in the bubble are Me Too companies that are copying each other. It's not very innovative. It's, 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 it's Darwinian, as you said. And... Um, that's the way it should be. I mean, that's Schumpeter said that, creative destruction. And if you can't, if you can't cut it in the long run, you don't deserve to be there. Uh, let's move on to a sort of structural question. Um, Teresa, you mentioned that you know, the, 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 the amount of capital in the industry was way too high 10 years ago. It's gone down, but maybe not enough. Um, two years ago, three years ago, during the credit crisis, I think the general received wisdom was that the VC firm uh, industry was about to contract sharply for structural reasons that the, the investors in the industry were themselves um, seeing you know, the sort of pressures that was simply going to force them to stop putting more money in. Um, has, has that happened or is that going to happen? And if so, how, how sharply do things contract from here? It has happened. It is happening. Um, but because of the reasons that Dick mentioned, which is that partnership commitments, so the investors' commitments to us and our commitments to one another, tend to be seven to 12 years long. It takes a long time. There's a long tail, if but you they will, can stop on those venture funds. They can, they can and do. Oh, not, not without a huge uh, penalty. Yeah, that's. You wouldn't want to do that. Pe people don't generally do that. I mean, and the other thing is, even though they're 12 years long, right? most of the capital gets called or invested in the first three to four years. So the reason I bring this up is you see, I, you know, I, I sit on the investment committee of my university, um, and do I see that we have shifted our asset allocation away from PE and VC, um, more driven actually by, because this last crisis was a, was a liquidity credit crisis, more because of the illiquidity. Because the commitments into these funds are seven to ten years, and yet, you know, operating costs like, you know, professor salaries and turning the lights on in the dorms are every year without fail. You see a lot of universities, um, it's not because they don't believe in the long term return for the right subset within the asset class, but there was a huge peel back in, in, in putting a huge penalty on illiquid assets, which PE and VC is part of. So that is continuing, but it takes a long time because you don't uncommit from a fund that's five or six years into it. You're, you're just about to get the returns. It doesn't make logical sense. So it's happening. It's going to take, you're just beginning to see it. What, where you see it is in the things that are unannounced, right? 
the venture firm that you've known for a long time that's not raising another venture fund. That's where you'll start to see it. You're not going to see some massive, you know, this isn't like the stock market. You're not going to see like one day all of a sudden 50% of the firms on Sand Hill Road are shuttered. That's not going to happen. But you see people not raising their second fund or their third fund or even their right. tenth fund. That's the uh, slow motion that I mentioned. So, what, so what's your advice to people looking to come into the venture capital business? Don't because it's a shrinking industry? I wouldn't wow. say that. I know. I mean, I think the, uh, I would join on a, uh, if you are, if you can sell yourself into a really good firm that uh, in a uh, entry level kind of a job, or if you're a successful entrepreneur and you bring a skill set and willingness to, to work really hard, um, I'd, I would certainly join one of the established firms. Uh I've got a couple of uh, couple of forward-looking questions that uh, uh, that, so, that people in the audience have raised. One of, one of them that was on my list here is about um, wh how venture capital um, applies to newer industries or other areas outside the traditional. And so it seemed that we were gripped by this sort of wave of self-confidence a few years ago, where people felt, you know, what we've discovered here is a new way of financing innovation and startups that is applicable to any kind of industry. And as technology disruption spreads, so this form of financing can. And this is a, a much bigger uh, future than maybe we thought of. And clearly, clean technology was the thing that was in everybody's sights. Um, here we are now, a few years later, we've seen Solyndra go bust very spectacularly. How do you feel about um, the VC model as it applies to clean technology? Has it worked? Well, Has it when, work? when we talk with our LPs in the front end of this, you know, obtaining commitments for the next fund, I, uh, we've been saying that uh, clean tech is the only thing that makes biotech look short term. <laughs> and uh, it is the way it is. That doesn't mean we're not going to do it. We are going to do it because it's a, there are lots, there are massive uh, needs in this area. What you have to do is uh, be, uh, again, lucky in part, but have the technical skill set within your own firm to differentiate between the basic economic shortcomings of a Solyndra and the more efficacious uh, aspects of a company that might not be a Solyndra. And it, it takes a lot of knowledge to do that. And you know, I mean, there's a, a there's a body of thought that that was you'll you'll start from the very beginning, Solyndra, because Solyndra. of the tech, because you had to go two through two layers of technology investment before you really got a product, and then the end result is you couldn't compete. And if you compound that with what's happened in China, as a you know subsidizing uh, panels, and the cylinder was uh, it was all organized around the ability to get more rays of sun on a, on a panel than you could get on a flat panel. I mean, in the end day, at the end of the day, that isn't a very big deal when you get to, because of the, the, the fundamental um, aspects of doing flat panels being so commodity-like. But a lot of very smart people back then sat down and looked at those financial models, including the Department of Energy and other people, and said, you know, on the projections that we can see, this is fundable and a successful business. Is Down a three times. Yeah. Just for the heck of it. So what lessons from clean tech? So the only thing that I would add is, you know, um, what, what we've always said is that you have to pick the right businesses with the right level of capital efficiency for the size of our industry, right? So even though we now have funds, you know, our fund is $500 million uh, currently, our current venture fund versus used to be $50 million. The math. If this is if this is a clean tech technology, which is one of the reasons why we stayed away from power generation, right? Whether it's batteries, solar thin films, or a lot of the other generation technologies, not that we don't think there's huge market potential, but if the going in plan that an entrepreneur shows you is it's going to take a billion dollars or seven hundred and fifty million dollars until you know, 500 million till I can prove the two layers of technology work and a billion dollars till I can be self-financing. How do venture capitalists with our measly $500 million, billion dollar funds, what, how do we have a place to play in that? It just, the, the numbers don't pencil out that way. And so I think that 
you know, it's a great thing, it's needed, and I think people who deal at that scale, maybe PE, maybe more likely project finance, because at that kind of scale, that's the only way you're gonna get that kind of capital, should do those types of things. The things we've done have been things that look more like from a capital deployment model and actually from a technology model, more like what the rest of our business is. We've done a few things in software, which are around energy management and energy efficiency, and they're fundamentally software companies, and so therefore their capital needs look like the other software companies that we fund. Um, so I think called? venture has a place to play there. It's hard, I mean, unless you're at a much, much larger fund. We, we, we figured out pretty early on, you know, battery tech, I mean, all of these things. Oh, the other thing I should say, which is I'm sure a lot of people already know, if an entrepreneur tells you it's going to take $500 million to get to break even, we double it. All right. Dick, you mentioned that this is, this is a very long term, this is longer term than biotech. Uh, we're four or five years into this now, I suppose, right. and this is a sort of stage where I think a lot of people have been hoping that, you know, they would be looking for exits. Um, so how do you read it now? Does that mean that this is now we can, we can put off the, the clean tech pay, payoffs for another five, no. ten years? No, I think, uh, I think you're going to be, you're going to see some uh, blockbuster winners. You have to name them? I don't know if I should, but uh, we're involved in a company called Bloom Energy, and uh, Bloom is That's a big risk. well. We've gone beyond the point of uh, you know we've proven the technology. We're way under the the multiple hundred million dollar uh, revenue level, and uh, no subsidies needed, and cash flow in a, in a good place. And I think uh, the need for that technology. I mean, I've been looking at fuel cells since uh, I graduated from college. And um, I've never found a practical one until this one. And I think this is a pretty, it's a, it's, I think it's going to be a very successful company. Another um, big question about the future. And, in, in modular and, form, by the way. In, yeah. Yeah. Another big question for the future and for the entire valley right now is obviously China, the China question. When I came here uh, nearly 10 years ago, I, I can remember talking to a partner in one big value firm who said, you know, there's no way we're going to play in China because they'd eat our lunch. You know, venture capital is a, is a local business where it's all about knowing the people across the street and the other side of the Stanford campus. Uh, that firm is now very big in China and it seems that there's been a sort of rush to rush across the Pacific, of which you've been part, Dick. Um, so, yeah. how, but how easy is it to play over there as a value firm? It's about as difficult as anything you can do in life, I'd say. You went for a year, right? I went for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. I am uh, a strong believer that you have to uh, put your feet on the ground and get your hands dirty and work with the people and hopefully learn enough to have at least a nuanced form of understanding of the culture that you're dealing with and the people. If you fly in and fly out, that's a pretty superficial way of doing things. So uh, we had a really excellent uh, partner who had been with our firm here, who was from China originally, went back to China and started our practice. We have offices in, in Beijing and Shanghai right now, and, and Excel does too, and they have their own special sauce that works over there for them. Um, my job going over there was not so much to figure out what we were doing, but rather what we weren't doing. The end result is that uh, it worked out really well and uh, it's working out very well. And um, so we've had, uh, we've done some four successful round trips where we had put the money in, came out, worked out well. So what, what proportion of your funds do you think you'll be investing in China in well, we, this time? We put aside uh, for planning purposes because we, we invest out of one fund. We don't organize country funds. Uh, so we, in our planning, we said approximately 10% of any A13 was going to be in each of India and China. It actually looks as though we'll probably wind up with about 5% in China and about 6% in India. And we have good teams and, and we have 24 companies in China now. So I, I think, again, it's all about getting on the ground and common sense, people assessment, making sure the goals are aligned. I mean, goal alignment to me is the magic phrase. You have to make sure the people you're working with, and that when you have the mistakes made, it's usually because there have been some kink in this goal alignment. If you're, you and the entrepreneur are on the same page or 
aspiring to have the same thing happen. That's, and that's the deal in China and India, too. You have to be sure that we're not working at odds with each other. So how do you uh, feel about China right now, particularly given the valuations uh, over there being extremely high? Is there a bubble over there that uh, makes it a difficult market to play? So we've... Um so we have different, we have country and geography funds. So uh, we're organized differently for many from that perspective. So we have 11 partners on the ground in China in three different cities, and they have their own funds focused on China. We have uh, four partners in India um, focused on India with its own India fund. And then I have six partners in London focused on sort of um, Europe and uh, the Middle East. Um, so. Have we seen the valuations increasing in China since in the last seven years since we had our first fund? Absolutely. Um, we've benefited from that some in the IPO market. There was a spate of uh, China-oriented IPOs last year for many venture firms that have been active there, and they benefited from that, from that perspective. I think that um, they've seen, they've not seen the same sort of bubble in what I'll call the late stage private companies in China in the same way we've seen here in the Valley. So they've certainly seen it on the IPO market and if you look at the aftermarket performance of a lot of China IPOs, you see how it's come down. Right. Um, and they've seen an increase in the pre-money valuations. But remember, these were in China, and I'm sure Dick will say the same thing, I don't know, even as recently as three years ago. In China, you could get a company that had been completely self-funded, um, because it was capital efficient, an internet company that was doing maybe small revenue, but three, four million dollars a year in revenue, which was cash sustaining. And you could invest in the company basically at, you know, one to two times revenue. I don't think Pretty we good ever deal. You, you can't find that here, right? Yeah. So has it gone up from there? It has. Sadly, it's still cheaper, I think, than here on the early stage. I don't think we ever invested in an unprofitable company in China. That's right. A question here, Dick, for you. Um, so we know you're in China. What about Brazil and India? How do you see those markets? And uh... You know, everything is extremely distinct. I think uh, India, um, we, we have a good team of people over there. The woman who runs it is a woman named Bala Deshpande. She was at a company called ICICI, which is about the most successful um, private funder in, in, in India, and she was the best partner in that, and she's assembled a team of eight people around her. And we're really going in the middle market business there. Again, these are all profitable companies. They're usually substantially larger than the companies in China. They're usually in the 30 to $50 million revenue level. And, um, and so there's uh, India, I think, is very, you know, there are, I think, 7,000 public companies in India. It's a huge, uh, the Bombay market is, you know, very, most of these are not traded very frequently. There's a whole separate set of circumstances in India. But it's a known, you know, India is going to be part of this picture for the long run. Brazil is fabulous. I mean, it's just coming up the curve like you can't believe. And uh, we have, today we have one company in, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, and it's doing really well. And I think there will be probably four or five others to follow it. We we have a, but Brazil is really. Go back over the decades. Brazil has, has at periods of time been the country of the future. Is, is this is this this is real this time? Is it? I think it's really. Your view, yes, it is. Putting money there. I would. I think yeah. they have a you know they have a government that's sensitive to the capital system. They're many ways better than we are. So uh, I think they're really well. You have questions on your cards. Wave them, wave them around, and someone will pick them up, and uh, we'll bring them up here. Um, a personal question here from someone in the audience: How does a top technical PhD find the proper VC to fund a new uh, technology? Well, I would uh, look at the uh, character of the, the the people in the firm in the, the VC firm that he's looking at, and uh, without knowing what field he's a PhD in. Normal, you know, we have a skill set that actually, and as does Excel, that actually incorporates an awful lot of technical skills uh, at um, a lot of individual vertical uh, capabilities. I would uh, search for those uh, firms that have uh, people with uh, 
you know, proven track records or skill sets that are equivalent to that vertical technology that he's a PhD in, he or she. And then start talking with them because that's the basis of the communication on which you can either, you know, build a, a dialogue or, or not. Any more general tips on how to approach VCs? I mean, how, how do you like to be approached by prospects? So the only other thing that I would add to that that relates to how to be approached is you should look at the, and I think this was what Dick meant by track record, so look at the investment portfolios of the firms and the individual partners and try to find, you know, if you think about what are the one or two or three companies that either from a product and technology perspective or a market perspective are most like the type of company that you're thinking of starting and go try to um, identify who the three or four or five or six venture capitalists who are that have backed those companies and how to be approached. You know, I think generally speaking, especially in, in deeply technical areas, chances are you will know or be one step removed from someone who was a technical co-founder or on the scientific advisory board of that company. Or if not, just because, you know, you're an expert in, you know, in, um, in Bayesian algorithms, you can probably, based on your CV, go and reach out to their Bayesian algorithm expert and say, hey, I'm thinking of starting a company, would like to talk to you about who your backers were. Because the other thing is, talk to them not only to get the introduction, usually most things come through an introduction. An entrepreneur that you either are working with or have worked with in the past, possibly um, another, um, you know, the lawyer who works for that firm, um, for that company's counsel. But also, when you talk to them, find out what they really think about the people that they work with. This is a two-way process. There was a funny line um, in several times in, in, the, in the, the film that Dick was in where you know, they asked the entrepreneur, well, why did you take money from so-and-so? It's like, because he told me he had money. Um, and, and I think all the entrepreneurs now benefit from the flip side of what we've been talking about here. There's a lot more money out there, a lot more money in venture capital firms. So interview who you want to work with too. So talk to these entrepreneurs not only for an introduction, but find out who you want the introduction to. I, who I, they enjoy I have another working idea. With. You know, Silicon Valley Bank, of which I happen to be lucky enough to be a director, uh, was one of the sponsors tonight. And what I would do is go talk to your banker at Silicon Valley Bank. Talk to your banker, that's right. Yeah, they, will, they know what there is to know about the venture business. Now, uh, there's a certain theme emerging from some of the questions here, and I would call it social media fatigue. Um, just to give you a sample, uh, in the past, VCs funded mostly companies with deep technologies that improve productivity. In the present, VCs fund mostly social networking companies that reduce productivity. Uh, or to put it differently, <laughs> to put it differently, do you think VCs should begin investing more heavily in and supporting R&D to help significant technological breakthroughs, not Twitter, Facebook, etc.? Too much, too much social media? I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I think it's, I don't disagree with part of that. But, um, you know, these are, they're changing the habits of people. That's what I said about the individual being in charge of their universe. It's a whole different set of discussions. I mean, we ought to be backing, we and we do back, a lot of development programs that are technical in nature. But there's, you know, this is a broad thing. There's a lot of room for social, for the benefits of the, uh, you know, the bottoms-up social society that we're building. But the, I mean, the big, to, to put that question differently, the big waves of, uh, of technological development and company formation in the Valley have come from fundamental technology changes, whether it's the integrated circuit or the internet or whatever you want to describe it as. Is, is social media, the social media bubble right now, something that's simply floating along on the surface of that, or is it something more lasting? You know, um, we were over in Egypt uh, from, until January 15th of this year and was with uh, Jim Schwartz, one of the partners, uh, and uh, it was just incredibly obvious the restiveness that was going on in Egypt and what had just happened in Tunisia. And all of this was uh, you know, essentially the communications this is a worldwide uh, phenomenon that's going on. You know, dictators can't get away with closing off the, even China, uh, closing off the, the, what's really going on in a country from its citizens. I mean, that's a thing of the past. And a large, a large amount of that is, is the ability to, to communicate through uh, the Internet, Facebook, uh, Twitter included. Other, what do you think, Teresa? 
three things about that. So number one, I agree with Dick completely that, you know, I think that the measure, if you talk to most of our entrepreneurs and, and what makes it so exciting to work with them is they all think they're changing the world. They don't all say, I'm creating a technology that's changing the world. Technology may enable me to do it, but they all think, and I know that sounds crazy, believe me, I, and I met with all, as I'm sure Dick did, I met with all the people who are trying to, to do e-commerce for pet food and ship around 50 pound bags in 1999, but believe it or not, they all thought that they were changing the world. So I think that's the fundamental key thing about the entrepreneurial spirit, and I think it would be hard to argue seeing what's happened, you know, whether it's the types of things that Dick was talking about more recently, or if you go back to sort of how many of us got our information about what was happening um, with our partners and our companies in Mumbai during the terrorist attacks, if not for Twitter or Facebook. Right. So I think if one of the measures of a successful startup is changing behavior or the world in some way, it would be hard for me to say that, you know, and obviously I'm biased, it would be hard for me to say that social media companies aren't doing that. But there's two other things. One specifically on technology. Each of these large, so technology can enable the wave or the wave can enable new technologies. It goes both ways, it's That's a right. synergy. So some of you guys may know about, um, you know, next generation flash based, based storage, as a for example. Um, we happen to also be, and as is NEA, an investor in a company called Fusion IO, which went public earlier this Fabulous year. Fabulous company. Their number one company, and why we ultimately um, ended up investing in it was, Facebook was their biggest installation. So these are the companies that are stressing the technology layers lower in the stack. If you go back in time, right, mm -hmm. I mean, look at Amazon, an e-commerce company, a company that, you know, what's so world-changing about shipping books from right. a warehouse in Washington? I mean, cloud computing and Amazon Web Services, I mean, that's because of what Amazon's been doing. There are countless technology companies that Google helped launch, right? And all and and other companies before them. So I think you can't just look at the surface of what the company does today. You need to look at this technology ecosystem is really an ecosystem. Technology, yes, fundamental change like the integrated circuit creates industries, but industries also create new technology needs in the infrastructure beneath. That's real hardcore technology because that's where they create the stresses. That that's why you, it's hard to be pessimistic about our future. Because these it's your things, optimism breaking through again, Dave. It is. <laughs> you can't stop it. So it's really, uh, it's really great to see these new forms of uh, communication and, and intelligence going on. That's just absolutely great. A, a related question that maybe broadens that, that, the last one out a little bit. Fads seem to be a giant problem in venture investing because time after time, huge pools of capital over-concentrate in segments that aren't ready or sometimes not even viable. So how do you prevent that repeated mistake. It's the, uh, it's, the, uh, cap it's the American way, you know. You have to be, you know, I think it's, it, that's one of, that's our job, is to not get Me Too companies going. I mean, that's the whole point. You know, ever since Fusion IO got to be so successful, two or three additional other companies have come up and tried to emulate what they're doing. It's not simple to do. Fusion IO is growing at 100% a year and profitable and just a great company, good management, the whole shot. But there are others, so I mean, I think it's up to us to have the discipline not to do that. And it's, uh, it's what, we, when we make decisions, we make them with the full, all the, all the investing staff, we give everybody, uh, gives their opinion about a deal. And we don't do it from the top down, it's the bottom up. And then we record all the, bits of advice and insights that people have about things, and ultimately uh, the decision is made. Thank all of you for uh, coming to the museum tonight. Uh, we really appreciate your interest in the topic. I mean, this is one of the fascinating topics and one of the broadest, most uh, relevant topics of what goes on around here, and uh, great representatives. Uh, I, I personally could talk to these uh, three folks for the rest of the evening and enjoy every minute of it. They might not like it. Steve, uh, let me just say, I think this Computer History Museum has been uh, absolutely uh, found object of great value in this valley. Because you have a place to congregate, to discuss this kind of stuff. It affects all of our lives every day. 
and you have a place to memorialize past exploit, you know, past championship rings and stuff like that. It's yeah. great. I just think it. This is what was needed in this valley. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah.